Experiment Nation, I'm Romil, and this is Adventures in Experimentation. Our panel of CRO professionals leverage their years of experience in UX and conversion copywriting to field common CRO questions. If you are new to the field, or even if you are a veteran, you'll always learn something new. So welcome everyone. This episode of Adventures in Experimentation has been brought to you with the support of our friends over at VWO. With me today are John and Eden, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Romil, uh, thanks for the introduction. So first time doing podcasts like this, I'm excited to start with Exper uh, Experiment Nation. So I'm John Ostrovsky, uh, also known as Positive John, um, Brazilian expat, uh, proud engineer, a data nerd, um, been in a long relationship with growth experiments and uh, normal distributions. Um, <laughs> at this moment, um, my full-time position is at Brainly, having fun running experiments to 350 million active users monthly, which is pretty awesome. And I'm always speaking up on some um, growth experiments, side projects on the side. Uh, today, working with iTech as well, exploring some different verticals, but we'll chat more about all that stuff. I just I just want to point out that you just said 350 million and growth. I'm like, where does that go from 350 million? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, uh, these are the official numbers, but it's only going up, man. <laughs> Education yeah. technology these days. Very, very impressive and, and, and jealous. Okay, and Eden, what about yourself? Thanks, Romul. So my name's Eden. I'm a conversion copywriter. I'm trained in anthropology and sociology. And for the past five years, I've been running my own micro agency, Greenlight Copy, helping uh, companies develop um, smart messaging strategies um, and copywriting to support the user journeys and increase their um, increase the conversion rates across the funnel. Very cool. And, and whereabouts are you located? Uh, I'm in Israel. I'm, I'm Australian, but I'm oh, very uh, nice. in Israel. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for, for joining. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to, to dive uh, into the question. So for those who are new to the podcast, uh, what we do in Adventures in Experimentation uh, is that we explore and answer questions from the community, uh, questions we've seen uh, as, we, um, uh, as we experiment, as we work with folks, as we work with clients. We, we get all these questions. And uh, this is an opportunity for us to address those questions. And um, for those who have their own questions listening to this podcast, feel free to reach out, uh, send in, send in the, your thoughts and, and your questions, and, and we'd be happy to pick them up and answer them on a future episode. Um, so let's dive right in. So I have a question here from Growth Mentor. Is that, is that how you pronounce it? Exactly. Okay, and from Growth Mentor. Uh, and it goes, I'd like to start with experiments, but I'm not sure how many I can run to start with. I feel like the, at least when I hear this kind of questions, um, are people asking, what does it take to start the process, to kick off uh, experiments from a team that never really touched uh, that kind of tool set? Eden, have you heard anything like that in your um, experience on copywriting side or even in growth mentor? Let's maybe scope uh, the, the question and the context that we have around the question before we jump into um, suggestions. Yeah, so from a question like this, it just hearing it, it makes me it makes me wonder. It's 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 like they're looking. They're kind of like you said. They're looking. They don't. They're not even sure what kind of tools or where they really need to start or what's going to what kind of tests are going to drive the most kind of the most value. At the end of the day, what are those going to what are those going to be quick um, quick tests? They can start pushing out. They can start um, they can start running and get some early wins in early on, and as they keep on expanding. So it sounds like there's a couple of areas here where um, this this person who's asked this question or anyone who's asking this question is unfamiliar with the tools, unfamiliar with what kind of tests they can run. Um, it, it does sound like someone very green. So how how would you go about uh, introducing someone into experimentation, who, who is this new? Uh, wh where would you start? Well, um, let, let me tell a, a quick backstory on that because this, this type of question takes me back a little bit. So this was the first question that really got me bogged down about how applied statistics uh, applies to experiments. You know, I, I remember my CEO back in letter.io a growth agency where I really started getting my hands around 
conversion optimization. He came to me for, for a big account a questioning, uh, okay, how can we do experiments for this account? We were trying to sell like a big CRO package. And the question was something like, okay, how do we start experiments and how many experiments per month can we run for this account? And I was like, how the heck can I summarize this, this question to a range or to a number? This is, this is scary. Uh, I don't really know how to go about this. Um, mm. So from, from that, I remember really studying this topic uh, specifically for quite some time. I got coaching from Tom Wesseling from uh, Online Dialogue and trying to understand yeah so trying to understand how how can i answer this with a range let's say you can run x amount of experiments per month um but at least from from experience um at this when facing this type of question i usually now do a step back um and, and here I'm not really reinvent the wheel. I just go, I'm, I'm gonna go with what Reforge uses as definition of like what it takes to experiment. I really bring the questions like, does this team have the right infrastructure, you know, the technology infrastructure to be able to deploy experiments efficiently? Uh, do they have the time that it's needed to get like valid results? And do they have the team knowledge uh, inside their team? to design, to execute, to analyze, and avoid false signals. So usually when I confront with those set of questions, um, the discussion goes to a more fu uh, fundamental and you know back to the basics um, discussion. Um, how, how do you guys experience this? So the way you, if I understand what you've just said, it's you kind of look at the client or whoever is asking and you're trying to figure out what their capabilities are um, in terms of do you have the people, do you have the tooling, um, do you have the, the time uh, to even run experience? So it's, like, it's not even, you're exploring whether that you can even start. Is that, do I have that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Because um, people don't sometimes don't really know all the costs involved in uh, running experiments, right? So scoping those three dimensions uh, usually gives me and the, the team confidence to proceed. You know, they really understand that, okay, infrastructure is there, time availability is there, and the knowledge is in the, within the team. Um, mm -hmm. And then from like, once we agreed we're on the right stage for running experiments, then what I follow up with is like a bandwidth calculation. Uh, where the outcome is usually like, yeah, the outcome is statistically valid answer for like how many experiments we can run per year, giving the traffic that we have in the different templates, the baseline conversion metric that we're trying to move and the alpha and beta values for experiments. But then like we're very in the nuts and bolts. Um, yeah. Like first scoping this like, okay, again, infrastructure, time, team knowledge. Then I jump to this more technicality of you know what's the number mm -hmm. and and ed and how would you uh, approach this so we've heard from john about looking at the, the nuts and bolts of it but how would you approach this yeah so um so i really john i really appreciate your insight into this from your perspective but from from the way this question is worded it really makes me think that this like you said, this person is extremely green. It sounds like they're not even really quite sure what they're getting into in terms of experimentation. This kind of feels to me like someone at sea level has come and said, we need to start doing experiments. Tell me how many we need to run a month and what's it going to cost and what's the budget and how much time and how many people do you need on a team and how much did the, like that's, that's what it feels like. This doesn't feel like the correct approach to experimentation. This is usually, I'm correct. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not, you know, you don't start thinking, well, how many experiments can I run a month? usually think what are we trying to look for what are we trying to solve with experimentation what are we trying like what are we trying to improve what are our mm -hmm. goals and then start to try and look at that kind of wider picture and start to break down so what's the reason what kind of like exactly like you said john what kind of tools do you have the infrastructure in place to support it how deep do you want to go into experimentation how much traffic do you have to support the expert you know this support the kind of experiments you want to run so it's actually taking just taking a little step back and actually looking at why they want to do this in the first place like what's their motivation 
for starting this is can they maybe can they maybe get the kind of insights um, that they're trying to in another way? Do they actually have to um, to go down this long like this long process? So it, it does sound like I, I think both approaches are valid um, in, in the sense that um, talking about what problems they're trying to solve and their goals is laying down the groundwork in terms of context. What is their environment? Uh, what is the situation that they're facing? Uh, and, and the other half of it is, okay, so now that we understand where you're at, your, your situation and and the um, what you're trying to achieve, what do you have available? Like, it's, it's almost like what you have is a subcontext of understanding their context, uh, un understanding their situation. So I, I feel actually the two um, answers are, are, are very complementary. I was wondering what you thought about that, John. Um, I must say I really like how Evan brings the figure of the sea level, you know, from a very <laughs> top down perspective, we need to run experiments. Tell me what's needed. Yeah. Um, yeah. A, a, a quick story to share on that. So uh, I, I was brought into a team in very similar conditions. Tell, tell us what is needed for us to run experiments in this homepage. Um, once again, before considering the infrastructure time team knowledge, uh, I went through the more technical calculations of, okay, let me see how many experiments we can put for, uh, you know, every month and ended up that we would be able to run like one experiment if we were very lucky per month. So the problem to be solved wasn't really experiments, was traffic first, mm -hmm. right? Um, and th this is how I see, like, as you suggested, very complementary, though, the two answers um, and the, the sea level figure from a top-down perspective uh, paints a, a funny picture. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's what we kind of find in a lot of our jobs or situations. Sometimes you have higher ups that have heard, you know, they've heard that experimentation is something cool or it's, you know, people are talking about it on LinkedIn. People are, you know, everywhere else. They think this, this is something everyone should be doing. So they say, yeah, we should be doing this too. Okay, I'm going to get this. Who, who do I need to talk to in growth or marketing or this? Yep, let's, let's start running experiments. What do you need? <laughs> like, and it's not, it's not such a simple process. Like you said, they might not even have enough traffic. They might not be able to run one experiment a month. And then it's like, okay, so you need to maybe reassess whether you're actually going to invest more into this moving forward. Like, do you want to just start doing one experiment a month or is it actually worthwhile investing in it and building out a team or at least a, you know, having a couple of dedicated people early on and then building it out that way. I, I kind of wanted to jump in there and ask, so I, how do you react? How, how, how do people who have asked you these questions, how do they react when you kind of, you know, show them reality? Well, with this traffic and with this resources, um, this is what you can do. And it's not the answers they're looking for. How do you um, make them okay with that? I like that. That's a good um, question. <laughs> I feel like this is where there's a lot of coaching involved in the process of experimentation because it's still not a very well explored field. I don't know, at least for, for, for marketeers. Um, I just don't want to generalize things. But my usually, like, the approach that I usually take is okay, like coming with those numbers, like if you work out the growth model and you're able to show like very clearly that traffic is a problem to be prioritized first and maybe, okay, we can start getting our feet wet with one experiment per month, just so you get that team involved and excited with the process, you know, because there's also this learning curve of getting excited mm -hmm. with the process of experimentation and getting people used that it's not all about wins, right? Uh, so when you're able to, to bring those things in a very clear way with enough process, trying that, okay, experiment is not really the tool for where we are in the growth stage of the company, of the product mm -hmm. for the now, um, C-level and management, they're, they're open to understand and then maybe shift um, resources where the, the more important problem to be solved is. At least that was my experience. But it, it, it took me time to develop like those right frameworks and mm -hmm. communication patterns to be able to, you know, clarify this. And it's more on the coaching side. So, so before I, I, I definitely want to hear what Eden has to say about this, but I, I kind of wanted to uh, make a, 
a remark on getting people excited about process. I, th- I, th- I thought it was a fun. <laughs> I, I usually don't hear that. I get what you're saying, but I've never heard anyone get excited over process um, other than experimenters. So I think that's, 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 that's kind of funny in my end, at least. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and Eden, uh, what, what's your take on it? How, how would you react? No, oh, yeah, so that so that's exactly right. You have to look at, like John said, getting them excited about the process. Getting setting it setting um you have to look at setting up those expectations from early on exactly. So what is experimentation? What are we doing here? What are we trying to solve? That the point of experimentation is that it's okay if it's not a win. It means you've still come away, you've still learned something as a result. You can still apply those learnings moving forward. It doesn't mean just because something, um, just because there was a win or a fail, you know, it doesn't mean that it reflects badly on on yourself or on the team or the, anything that you did. It just means, okay, great. So we can take this, what we've learned and we can apply it moving forward. Um, but yeah, there's, but again, it's getting them, it's setting up those expectations, getting them aware that there is a process, there are certain uh, requirements that we have to meet along the way in order to make sure that you know there's data integrity and everything at the end of the day um and that and that does take time and that does take that coaching just like john said so to jump on that so you've um you've managed expectations you've kind of showed models you've um gotten all these folks on board with process and now they're running experiments so let's, let's uh take that um, as a scenario, and then something's broke. <laughs> uh, I, there's another like question that. coming. <laughs> so, 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 there's another question coming up, but I kind of thought about okay, so you just manage this person's expectations about what should happen, and, and uh, learning's better than than winning, but they are still going to expect wins. Obviously, mm-hmm. um, what happens when you break something? When you're breaking experiment in productions, in in production, sorry. Um, how do you how do you manage that situation? I, I'd like to start with Eden. Good question. I don't. Um, from my personal experience, I haven't always been involved in the nitty gritty of the experimentation side, but I think um, what we see happen a lot is that when is when we get those last minute changes. It's when you start when you start planning and you start designing the experiment, and then someone someone comes someone on the periphery like comes in like we do, like we spoke before it's or a manager or it's a C level or something come someone kind of from the outside that hasn't been involved in the planning process from the getting come and sticks their nose and says I think a b c or d and that changes that changes some element and it kind of throws the whole experiment off because you've introduced another variable at a later stage of production when it shouldn't have been so are you saying if someone comes in the late stages and something breaks your point at them no, 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 what I'm just saying, but just, you know, the point of, the point of all, good point, no, but the point of all experimentation, you know, you just, you want to reduce, uh, limit as many variables as possible, because the more variables, the more, the harder it is to get, to get clearer, you know, to get clearer results, to have that clear, um, to have clarity on the final result. To your point of adding um, less t- minute changes uh you know no front end engineer likes to work under pressure like that um yeah experiments usually go broke uh when when we have less minutes change Uh, i don't know about you guys but just when i heard about the uh what are the many ways that we can break experiments in production i just started typing down everything that pops to my mind because I, I keep a score on this personally. It's a, it's my uh, personal list of shame wow. <laughs> that I always keep it on the side. So I make sure me and my team uh, never commit it again. Um, but yeah, I, I have four uh, like top ones um, that caused us uh, trouble in the past. Uh, and trouble I mean is you have an experiment going through one week live in production and then you see that you forgot to publish the Google Tag Manager container with your conversion event. That's one week of no conversion events being fired, and you just need to go and restart your experiment. That was uh, one of the, the, the top ones. Uh, it hurts. <laughs> it's funny. It's cringy. It hurts. But it happens. You know, you're, you're just doing the debugging uh, on Tag Manager in a different workspace. You forget to to, to 
click the publish button, uh, especially when different people have the publish uh, access to the container. Sometimes the person doing QA is not the person who publishes. So this miscommunication gets those things wrong into production and we, we lose time. It's nothing uh, crazy on the user experience, but for the experiment validation, it's, it's purely time lost. Um, another two regard, uh, related to, to QA is, um, so yeah, for getting events firing across platforms, especially when you're dealing with Android and iOS, apps or individual platforms because most of the times like they're different engineering teams uh right they're very specific like android uh, engineers and ios engineers the coding language is different so if you don't really coordinate having the same event with the same aliases uh firing uh, in, in both sides that really complicates things and it's on the hands of the qa engineer to support on that front it's something that, that uh, I suffered in the past with. Um, yeah, I think the, the last one here, yeah, the, <laughs> this was a recent one. Um, you're running a, a mobile only, or for example, a logged in only experiment, and you forget to set up the targeting on Google Optimize. So you end up showing that to, to all people. Yeah, so sometimes depending on the code, that's not really a problem. But on your experiment side, when once you like query the data, you're counting all users instead of users of that only segment. Of course, you can write um, do all the, the processing and ETL, uh, but your query gets a lot more expensive on the Google Cloud side. Mm -hmm. So this hurts on, on that direction. So um, you actually have... Let me get this straight. You actually have a list of every way you've broken an experiment. What do you do with this list? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I just told you guys, it's the list of shame. <laughs> do, do you share? What I meant was like, do you, do you share this with anyone or is it like your personal list of shame? Uh, no, uh, actually. So in, yeah, in, in Brinley, uh, this, this I can tell about. Uh, so my experiment, like my growth team, uh, every three experiments, we have our uh, experiment review meeting that it's an open meeting to people that they can uh, participate. We do a quick slideshow of, okay, this was the experiment that we run. Which variant do you guys think won? And then people vote, and then we kind of have fun of uh, showing if there was a, a winner or it was um, irrelevant, uh, insignificant. So in this meeting, we always also review what went wrong and then we open to the other people of the company to learn from what went wrong. So we have other QA engineers from different teams that pass their eyes through, okay, this setup was wrong that, at that time. Maybe we can come up with a automation for, for mm -hmm. that QA side. So this is why I keep track of the list. It's just something that we, we keep constant reviewing. Um, and, and it really helps, you know, especially when you have rotation between teams, the platforms that we use also, they change. Right, so you can set up something via uh, Google Optimize, but that particular setup can be via code. Uh, it's just that different engineers operate in different ways, right? So having this open meeting and reviewing the list of shame uh, kind mm -hmm. of streamlines that, that uh, understanding across the company. And it's a it's an interesting way to advocate, at least from so my perspective. You're using this list essentially to um, add content to a retrospective. Um, yeah. with product teams in a uh, knowledge base I, I think uh, makes sense. yeah it, like usually when i've run retrospectives the there you know what went wrong what went right for the period and and kind of like that, that's where it stops i mean we have action items to continue and improve later on uh but there isn't this running list and that's actually a very interesting concept of this. it's kind of like a, a, a hopefully it's not that long a list but it, it's a list of things <laughs> to check against um that did you make sure that this doesn't happen this is that's uh, that's an interesting approach. Yeah, um, it, it's usually the mission of the the QA that I that I say. You know, um, we we our team is moving fast. We make sure we break things fast, but then the QA needs to help us to at least find those uh, things we're breaking even faster in the production. So this list actually helps them. So in, and you do this, like you mentioned, you you do this kind of um, every three experiments and and reviewing. 
um, experimental results. I, I wanted to hear from from Eden around how do you present results? Um, is, is there a cadence, or and and how do you uh, ensure everyone's going to be okay with what the the outcomes are? So, and um, in terms of making sure that everyone's kind of on board um, or at least prepared for what what the outcomes might uh, what the outcomes are, whatever they end up being. Um, whatever they end up being at the end is it comes back to setting up those expectations up front, just being having a realistic, I mean, like you said, everyone's going to always, we're always hoping for a win. Everyone's always hoping for a win, but to be pre at least being prepared for failure is um, to accept it, uh, being ready to accept the likelihood of failure is it goes a long way in helping whether the, whether the results, no matter what they end up being, if it's, you know, if there's a, if there's a huge, if it's a huge win, if it's a small win, if it's, um, or if we failed and we failed by how much, um, but really having, mm -hmm. having that kind of open, having that open discussion, getting as many people involved as possible, just like John, um, as John mentioned, in sharing the results around and having an open discussion is really crucial in help in helping just helping to push those ideas forward. So just what did we learn as a result? How can we apply this moving forward? What are we going to do differently next time? Um, you know, and again, try it, like John said, trying to <laughs> pinpoint all those tiny things that maybe we could have, you know, this is what we should have done better or this is what we can try differently. I'm, I'm curious, how many people do you share the results with? Like, in, at least with the, the folks that you've, you've worked with, um, I, I assume it's not an email to the entire company. So how do you decide the scope of who should receive uh, or should be included in these conversations? Hmm. Very good question. Um, yeah, I refined this communication process mostly during uh, Reforge. In the experimentation deep dive, they have a module only talking about communicating uh, up and down the chain of command, the different values and information that gets out of a growth team. Um, what I do, like it's like very simplified with my team today. Uh, we basically have a business summary template that we send to the major team because the growth team lives inside a bigger team, right? It's kind of a, a chapter. Uh, so there's this business summary that always contains the link for the more um, analysis, right? So a, a spreadsheet that we're using, uh, the nitty gritty of the analysis and the analysts recommendations uh, based on that. So if there's anything weird in the analysis, we usually call the experiment review meeting. If there's nothing weird, this is where then after uh, three experiments, we will have the experiment review meeting anyway. Uh, and this is where we open the communication to a broader public of the company. Then it's kind of an open meeting. Oh, wow. So this is how, yeah, this is how we try to advocate the, the culture of experimentation in a smaller side. So inside of this um, team, I don't know if you're a growth team inside an engagement chapter. Uh, so you send this business summary to the entire engagement team because they can benefit out of that learning in different areas of a product, let's say. Uh, but then the experiment review is this idea of getting fresh eyes and people to uh, maybe challenge the results that you found out of those three past experiments. So this is how we're trying to do like the up and down chain of command communication today. Uh, I still have a couple other things to, to improve, especially like the management and C-level communication of where experimentation should go towards improving growth of the company in a more mm -hmm. like proactive approach, but we're, we're still not there yet, still growing. Hmm, that's very cool. Uh, and then anything to uh, add to that? Um, actually, I just wanted to ask, so John, what do, you, what do you feel is like that main barrier to getting kind of C-level or higher ups kind of um, on, the, on the same page with experimentation? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, yeah, what I usually try my best to do is to understand like, what are the metrics that they are looking in their weekly basis, mm -hmm. right? So my VP of subscription is looking at the total number of subscribers, right? Something along those lines. My director of product is looking at the overall retention of the product. 
So if you're able to see uh, from either a qualitative data point or a quantitative analysis that there's area of improvement of that metric that it's concerned that, that concerns them because they have the KRs attached to that metric. This is where I see experimentation as a very uh, high leverage conversation with that stakeholder. So whenever, uh, again, if I have any idea from the broader team, from internal discussions, from other 101s that touches, okay, this is potentially a good uh, experiment to run towards the total number of subscribers, I'm 100% sure that my next 101 with the VP of subscription, um, they will listen to it uh, with more intention. Uh, but it, it's always this exercise of what is the KPI that it's in their mind and how experimentation can be a higher leverage for them. It's just a tool for them. And, and then this is how I see the, the communication facilitates a lot. How do you guys feel about that? Right. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, tying it back to back mm. to those key KPIs as in with what they're looking for. And so you can show how that ties in directly to it. That's always um, that always makes it very powerful and it makes it very relevant for them. It's related to exactly what they're doing. Yeah, I feel like for, for some of the people listening, maybe it's easier said than done because um, I'm coming like Brinley's a very data informed company. You know, people talk data very often. So it's easy for you to tie discussions towards the metric that it's in a stakeholder's mind. But if you don't have a stakeholder that talks in terms of numbers, we already have a barrier in the communication there. So mm -hmm. it's, it might be necessary like a different path of like, okay, how experiments can be a high leverage for someone who doesn't speak in terms of data. Maybe a testing, de-risking their, uh, you know, crazy and new shiny ideas, um, possibly when numbers are not very relevant in a discussion. Uh, but stakeholders, they all have uh, edgy ideas that they're willing to experiment with. If you can position that as, okay, so, you know, this whole thing that I do with AB tests is a way to de-risk um, putting your idea in production. Maybe we could try that together. I also saw that working when he was a stakeholder that just wasn't very, you know, um, familiar with, with more talking numbers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It sounds like um, regardless if they are data driven or what have you, the, the, the strongest approach or one of the strongest approaches is to make whatever you're saying relatable to the stakeholder. So to understand what they care about, um, hopefully it's metrics. If it's not, you can one day convince them of metrics, but, uh, but really it is about figuring out what do they care about? What pressures are they under to deliver and ensuring that your program uh, speaks to those needs? W would you say that's fair? Eden, I feel like you can complete this discussion from a very like communication perspective, like meeting the audience where their mind is at. <laughs> I feel like it's a it's a universal rule of thumb, but bring us your specialist thoughts on that. <laughs> uh, th thanks, thanks for that, John. Um, no, but uh, absolutely, it's as as soon as you show. So you know, we're all passionate about what we do as a living, but as soon as but it's in terms of crossing that barrier of communication, as soon as you can tie what what you're doing directly into the other person's goals the other person's agenda the other person's what you know what they're the pains and problems that they're struggling with and you can show them how you're helping them how you're supporting them how you're lifting them up how you're helping push their agenda forward they're going to be more but by, by framing what you have to share with them from their point of you know relating it to back to their context they're going to immediately become much more open to hearing what else you have to say it's like you know it's um you know, you do, you do a favor. It's, um, you know, the recipro reciprocity from the beginning. You do something for them and they'll be more than willing to do something for you. So the more you position your findings, you position the results, you talk about it in ways that it's going to benefit them. It's going to help them move forward with what they want to do. 
then it will make them much more it will automatically help them be more in tune with with it it does help them be in tune with listening to what you have what you also have to share beyond that so they actually become more interested let's say hey i can see this is meeting my needs i see this is how it's relating to me i see that this is relevant maybe they have something else interesting to share i'm ready and willing to listen you see we we started this topic with a list of the many ways things can break in production out of an experiment and we're finishing with tiny bits of Cialdini on reciprocity. That's a beautiful <laughs> loop. So that's it. What did we learn today? Well, we learned that when someone comes to you asking about how many experiments to run, we need to get more context. Context on their tech stack and their bandwidth, as well as their goals and what they're trying to achieve. And we also learned the value of keeping track of our mistakes. It's all about learning, isn't it? And finally, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you haven't already, and you think we earned it, of course, please consider subscribing. Thank you, and until next time. <laughs>